So welcome to part four in my series on history of viruses. And I should point out actually that this is not just about traditional computer viruses, but really also about the way that malware in general has evolved. And of course, viruses are one example of malware. And in this fourth part of the uh, series, I'll talk about what happened between the year 2000 and the year 2012, more or less. And, and 2012 is kind of where we are presently, but I don't know when you'll be watching this video. So maybe in a couple of years, some of the stuff I'll say now will have been uh, out of date. So I want to kind of be clear that we're talking about the last 12 or so years approximately. Uh, and in particular, the big trend over this time, I think, has been the notion of, actually, I think there have been two trends. One has been in the area of um, what we call corporate espionage, maybe we'll call it cyber espionage. Okay, so cyber espionage. And the other big trend has been in cyber warfare. And we'll talk about each of those trends uh, as we proceed. Okay, so in cyber espionage, there have been a handful of, of important use cases to keep an eye out for. And, and certainly the big one that really kind of kicked it off in terms of the media has been in the area of, of uh, an attack called Aurora. Uh, this is also called Hydrac, and it affected a number of big companies, and Google was one of them, but there were also a number of other companies that were uh, targeted uh, by, this, uh, by this particular attack. Now, what was really kind of interesting, at least from the perspective of external perception, is that, uh, you know, for the most part, up until this point, a lot of malware had been, uh, you know, there was, there was an initial phase where malware was much more about notoriety, then we kind of moved into profitability. And now this is kind of the, the, the next level of profitability, which is going towards cyber espionage. And it's gotten a lot of attention, but really, you know, this area is not entirely new and it, malware has been used for these purposes really for quite some time. It's just that fewer people have noticed until some of these more major attacks took place. Uh, then aside from Aurora and Hydra, there was also an attack on RSA uh, that got a lot of attention. Uh, and then there's been some uh, attacks on the oil and gas industry and petrochemicals and a uh, bunch of others, and you can you can look around for interesting reports on these attacks. Uh, and, and I think that there have been fancy names like Night Dragon and Shady Rat and a few others for some of these attacks. But for the most part, uh, it really just goes to show that uh, there are attacks that are, uh, they're not maybe particular to any one vertical in the industry, but really they attack a whole set of enterprises across a set of industries that are very diverse. Uh, so they're not just targeting one individual, but really are trying to target useful information across uh, multiple organizations. Now, some of these attacks, you know, are financially driven. They're designed around making money. Other attacks are uh, driven by so-called hacktivist groups, and, and some of the names you'll hear here are uh, people like Anonymous. Anonymous is a major group, and also another group called Lulsec. Lulsec. I kept spelling it wrong. L U L Z S E C. Lulsec, uh, and some others, and, and they were actually driven more by. Uh, notoriety than anything else. So not everybody was after making money, but some of them were trying to compute or, or conduct cyber espionage uh, in order to uh, just to make a name for themselves. Now you might be asking, why do these people care about this data and, and what are they trying to go after? Well, the big things they're trying to go after with all these attacks are things like uh, source code, proprietary information, uh, uh, so secret information. Maybe an organization has interesting plans for what they're going to be doing in the future and uh, they don't want that to become public. Uh, and that's obviously the kind of stuff that uh, some of these guys are going after because it's worth quite a lot. Uh, customer data is another big one. Maybe uh, an organization might have a lot of customer data from transactions, and if you're able to steal that data, it's very valuable. Now, I think what is particularly scary about these attacks is that not all of them were particularly sophisticated from a technical perspective. In fact, things like the Aurora attack and the RSA attack in particular uh, were really driven by by simple mechanisms, in fact, I think I would say that really social engineering was at the heart of both of these attacks. Really what happened is uh, somebody, an engineer at a company, or maybe somebody in one of the departments was tricked into or socially engineered into opening up an email attachment. Maybe that email attachment contained a spreadsheet and it was sent to somebody in the finance department. And so once the email attachment was opened up, the compromise was able to take place. So it didn't require any kind of zero-day vulnerability or complicated technical vulnerability. Uh, but there are certainly some attacks that do uh, rely on more technical vulnerabilities, and, and these attacks weren't one of them, but, but the other attacks have relied on things like uh, SQL injection, for example. Uh, that's a common way to, in fact, SQL injection is a common way to steal customer data because you can get data from within uh, somebody's databases. And, and sometimes you've seen some attacks that involve things like uh, zero-day vulnerabilities and that sort of thing. 
Okay, so that's really what I want to say about cyber espionage. Then going beyond cyber espionage, you have cyber warfare, and that kind of takes things to a whole new level. Uh, and the most famous example in terms of cyber warfare was a threat that's called Stuxnet. And Stuxnet got a lot of attention a couple of years ago. Uh, and in particular, Stuxnet, uh, what made it very interesting is it appears to be state-sponsored. Uh, in fact, I think that's now been more, more or less confirmed, but uh, you never know what these things for sure. But the, the evidence is, is definitely pointing towards state sponsorship because of the technical sophistication. It had multiple zero-day vulnerabilities. And, and they recall that a zero-day vulnerability is a technical vulnerability that was discovered by the larger security community after exploits actually appeared in the wild. And Stuxnet also and had multiple zero days, which is really strange. Uh, it appears to have targeted, and it really shouldn't say appears, but actually did target uh, SCADA systems. So it's trying to target critical infrastructure and specifically targeted the Siemens S7300 system and its corresponding modules. And these systems actually were used within Iran's nuclear power program. Uh, Stuxnet was interesting also in that it actually was capable of causing a physical malfunction of these devices by effectively making them operate in ways that uh, they really weren't designed to handle. And, and I personally think it's interesting because this particular threat, Stuxnet, really towed the line between virtual damage and actual tangible physical damage. It actually made these devices spin in ways they weren't meant to spin and actually caused them to break down. So, uh, you know, if, if I had to kind of go back in history, I think many years from now, people will say that Stuxnet marked a pivotal moment in the history of malware. It's really going to be that, that critical in terms of the way that, that malware has evolved. Now, a little bit after Stuxnet uh, came out, there was a new threat that was discovered. It was called Dooku. Uh, it was identical to Stuxnet uh, in many regards, although it was uh, it appears to have a different purpose. Really, it was, it was designed to kind of do what's called information gathering and really maybe information exfiltration. So the idea is gather information that's interesting and then exfiltrate it or send it out to somebody else who might be able to make more use out of it. Okay? Uh, and... The, the hope was that, I presume the hope with Dooku was that this information exfiltration could then be used as a vehicle for facilitating future attacks that are similar to, let's say, Stuxnet. And then more recently, there's been a new threat that, that's gotten a lot of attention called Flame. And actually, I did some videos on Flame, so uh, you can check those out if you want to get more details. But again, Flame actually has a lot of common componentry with Stuxnet, and, and based on its level of sophistication, it appears to be also a state-sponsored cyber weapons. And so... Uh, if you're interested in Flame, definitely check out the videos on that topic. Anyway, I will stop here. I hope you found this useful. And this kind of concludes my initial series on the history of computer viruses and malware.